Cisco. The bridge to possible. Welcome to this episode of Cisco Chat Live. I'm Stephanie Garafa, and I'm the Social Media Manager for Learning at Cisco and Guest Monitor for this week on the Hybrid Engineer, where networking meets software development. Before we get started, a reminder that we'll be taking your questions live at the end of the show. Use the Cisco Chat hashtag on Twitter or post your question in the comments if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube. Okay, so joining us today, um, we have Joe Clark, Distinguished Engineer here at Cisco and an integral part of our engineering team for 20 years now. Holds a CCIE, he's a champion of network programmability and automation, as well as a contributor to the Internet Engineering Task Force and a regular speaker at Cisco Live. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks, Steph. Great. Um, let's get started. Cool. Um, the rapid pace of digital transformation calls for a new kind of network professional. How has technology changed the landscape for IT professionals? Well, you see it every day. You see it with the fact that we have new user experiences, mobile everywhere. Customers, they're end customers. They're demanding a better way of, of reaching um, that organization, that business. They're demanding new user experiences. And all of that requires rapid change. If you're not doing it, chances are your competitors are. So how do you keep up with that? How do you start making technology work for the needs of your business? How do you start integrating what you're doing from an IT perspective into things like cloud uh, delivered solutions? Um, so that you're scaling, you're better able to scale to meet those new user experiences. How are you able to adapt to how your employees are changing and how the, the uh, landscape of working is becoming more virtual? We're also seeing security play a key role into this. Attackers are getting a lot more clever. Um, how are we adjusting the network so that we're combating those attackers while at the same time offering that seamless user experience uh, to our customers? And these are the challenges that, that organizations are going through. And what they need to, to do is not just keep up with this pace, uh, use technology to keep up with this pace. They need to outstep it. They need to get in front of it so that they're able to adapt faster than their customers need them to and certainly faster than their competitors are going. Great. Um, so the title of our chat today is The Hybrid Engineer. Yeah. Can you explain what the term hybrid engineer means? Sure. It, it might be getting a little bit uh, long in the tooth. Um, a while back, there was this notion that uh, network engineers, the people who knew the BGPs, the OSPFs, the routing protocols that knew how the network interconnected, that, that they were the, 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 the kings, queens of the castle. That they had uh, all the, the necessary skills. But as we just talked about in question one, because of the technology landscape is changing, because those end customers, those users, demand more from, from the uh, businesses that they interact with, it was how do we achieve what we want? How do we achieve that, that pace? How do we get out in front of what our, our customers expect and, and what our competitors are doing? And the way to do that is with software skills. So this idea of a hybrid engineer was merging the, the network engineering skills with software and automation skills to be able to achieve the, the pace, the agility, the dynamic nature um, of the, the, the business requires and about how do we apply the, the needs of the business, those, those outcome-driven needs within the network. And so now I, I say it's a little bit long in the tooth because I think what we're seeing now is, is these are becoming more normal skills. People are looking to, to automate more. They're looking to be, do more with software, maybe not at, at the development or programmability stage, but they are doing more within the network. And we're going to see that continue uh, to evolve and continue to transform as technology plays such a, a pivotal role uh, in uh, all types of business landscapes. Yeah, yeah. the move towards um, software-defined networks has changed the skills that IT and networking professionals need to be successful in the modern data center. So the skills employers are looking for have changed. Um, can you tell us why this is? Sure. Um, one thing I heard recently, or fairly recently, was that uh, 
people were looking at, in particular, our, our Cisco certified internet working experts, the CCIEs, and they were saying, this person is an expert in networking, in IT, let's say, mm -hmm. and especially in, in smaller uh, organizations, but not just limited to that, uh, employers were saying, I've got this expert. We invested a lot of time in this individual. We're looking to them to be technologists for our organization. We're looking at them to be the architect, to be the CTO, CIO type individual who can say, I've heard of automation and programmability. I've heard blockchain. I've heard analytics and, and, and uh, data science. I've heard of uh, IoT, Wi-Fi 6. I've heard of 5G. How do these technologies, how are they going to affect our business? How do we internalize this to achieve outcomes, to, to do what we want to do, to, to, to reach our customers in new ways? Mr. and Ms. CCIE, help me. Help our organization do that. So the, the, the experts were looked at as being that kind of, of of technologies, that oracle, to be able to say, this is how we're going to transform. This is how technology is going to become important to us. This is how we're going to use technology to either grow the top line, grow the bottom line, but achieve more with our business. And so it becomes very key that employers are looking for those, um, those IT engineers, those IT professionals, who can think in a more broader sense around technology and understand those transformative needs and can help bring that uh, into the organization and think not just in, in, in terms of the technology, but in terms of how the technology um, can make a difference for the organization. Sure, sure, thanks. Um, and I'm sure a lot of our listeners are asking themselves this question, what specific skills should IT professionals be focusing on to be successful in today's environment? <sighs> this is... <laughs> and almost as soon as I say it, I think it's going to change. Uh, things happen so quickly. Um, so you mentioned I've been here 20 years and maybe didn't look it, but yeah, 21 actually, half my life at Cisco. Um, and when I started, we were going through a transformation with uh, voice over IP. Uh, after that, we started to see um, Wi-Fi become, uh, people at, at conferences stopped sitting around the walls, plugging in, it became Wi-Fi was the thing. And then virtualization started to roll out. Um, and what we're seeing now is virtualization has become so prevalent. And we're actually seeing evolutions in that space as well with things moving from just a, a virtual machine to containers, uh, microservices, uh, cloud connectors into serverless and, and more of on-demand type uh, compute. And, and that's permeated into the networking space as well. So virtualization is key. Being able to automate that virtual world, being able to meld the virtual world with uh, physical networking gear, physical compute gear, being able to combine cloud and on-prem uh, is, is critical. Being able to look into what's happening across the IT landscape and say, this is what how our customers are using it. This is how our employees are using it and apply data analytics to that and obtain insight from that. Data science is going to be critical. And being able to see how is this going to be relevant to the business. We're not just doing, uh, we're not just playing in the technology game for the technology's sake. How are we going to make use of this in the business? And like I said, these are going to change. These are what we're seeing people embracing these skills, looking to uh, see how they can fold them into their career, how, how they can fold them into their organization. But they are going to change. Over time, tomorrow, five years, these change, and we need to be able to keep up uh, with those changes. Mm -hmm. And we've heard, we've heard it's essential to develop this DevOps mindset. Um, can you give us a real example of how DevOps skills are used? Sure. Um, so DevOps is that uh, melding of the... Um, it's an iterative process melding of the, the traditional software type skills and, and thinking about um, how, we do, uh, how we do operations with more of um, uh, a collaborative sense. Um, it's about making things more replicable, more reliable, and doing things more at scale. And from my own personal experience, because uh, I also like to kind of use our products as a customer from time to time and get that perspective, um, you mentioned I participate in the uh, IETF. Uh, I also speaker at Cisco Live. I also help with the network operations team. 
uh, specifically at Cisco Live in Europe. And we have been kind of eating this dog food or drinking the champagne, however you want to uh, call it, for a few years now. We, our mantra, by the way, at Cisco Live Europe is it's got to work. And we repeat that n number of times. So in order to have things that, are, that have to work, we, we try to keep things simple and we try to see what we can do. What, what are the pain points that we're facing and how we can apply automation? So we took a, a look at this a few years back and we said, well, what, are, what is the first thing? What are the first things that we should be automating or further simplifying? And we started to apply automation around uh, device level onboarding, bootstrapping of all the thousand or so switches, and access points we deploy into the network. Then we started to see, well, okay, how do we avoid going to each of these devices to do configuration changes like port uh, VLAN changes or QoS or policy changes on the router? And we started to build uh, blocks of config, object, uh, objective config, if you will, and apply them through a central point. So we didn't have fingers on keyboards. We had more of a policy-driven approach. And the moral of this is we did this iteratively. It wasn't something that we just turned on. We, we started to roll this out iter iteratively. And then over time, we started changing how we do, uh, how we do monitoring. Uh, we applied um, uh, chat ops type principles, meaning we took uh, Spark or WebEx Teams, uh, as it is now, and we said, how can we make that more of a, a way of getting information out of the network and offering a bot uh, approach to uh, self-service? So we created a bot that would allow uh, engineers as they're out on the floor to make certain uh, changes or to request certain things like uh, doing DHCP mapping uh, or finding, locating a user in the network. So that we didn't, we, we eliminated choke points or, or uh, slowdowns in the network and we were able to move things more quickly because we had that, uh, that automation that was ensuring reliability. Same thing at the IETF. So. I also help out with the conference network there. Uh, a few years ago in Prague, we had a critical meltdown of the network. So you can imagine all of these very smart engineers running around because the network was down and we had no, excuse me, no idea what was going on. And we were just making changes left, right. We got to stop this. We're, we're adults. We're volunteers, but this is a real network. Um, so we started to apply some of the same principles. We started to templatize all of our config. We started to use Ansible, not just to deploy the config to the network, but to deploy services to uh, our monitoring services. We started to do um, a replicable bootstrapping of devices. And again, we kept iterating and adding more of this um, as we did it. And an important thing to note is in both cases, Cisco Live, ITF, our teams didn't shrink. Uh, we didn't need less people. What we found is we could do more. We could add more services. Like at Cisco Live, if you've been, you might have seen the new mobile app and Find My Friends. These are services that we were able to add on to the network because we got rid of or we automated away a lot of those pain points. And what this has done, at least for me personally, is given me some, some better insight. So when I talk to customers at Cisco Live um, and I hear their stories about how they're trying to uh, take the same type of first step approach or how they're telling me about how, what they're going to do next or, or looking for next steps. It's been very rewarding to hear about their uh, achievements and, and also being able to say, well, here are things that work, here are things you might want to consider that it doesn't have to be an overnight overhaul of the network. You can start applying these practices um, in small pockets, seeing what works and, and iterating over that. Sure. So, so let's build on that a little bit. Sure. Um, so, so tell us some of the common misconceptions about networking automation and um, how that'll impact demand for IT pros. Sure. Um, one of the, the the most common and probably the oldest is what I was just talking about. Is automation means we can do more with less and less people. Um, not necessarily. Uh, you don't necessarily want to do less or, or, or do more with, with less people. What you want to do is eliminate the pain and have those people, the same people that you have, grow their skills and look at different areas of the network. Do cooler things with the technology. We talked about that rapid pace of change. We talked about needing to develop new user experiences and meet your end customer uh, where they want to be met. Um, how do you do that? Uh, you need the people. 
The people are going to be the ones that have the ideas. The people are going to be the ones that, that innovate. You need them freed up from a lot of that the, uh, remedial or mundane task work to be able to focus on those cool new things. The other thing that uh, I heard, I, I hear, and, and I was at a conference recently in Chicago, and I heard it in the hallway, someone saying, um, I got into networking so I didn't have to become a software engineer. I didn't have to become a developer. So is this push towards software, towards automation, call it DevOps, call it software defined or software driven, whatever, does it mean I'm going to have to become a, a software engineer developer? Answer is no. Um, automation is going to make parts or aspects of, of your IT life a lot easier. Um, you might have to, you might want to learn uh, programming language to, to write uh, scripts to be able to do some of these uh, these tasks, automate some of these tasks. But there are frameworks, there are, there are capabilities out there uh, where you don't have to be writing applications every day. But you have to be uh, familiar with these concepts and you have to be willing to embrace them to see how things can change and transform within your organization. Yeah. And that brings me to the last uh, misconception is it everything we do in this space has to be immediately transformative or immediately uh, revolutionary. It just has to be an overall, has to happen overnight. And, and as I mentioned, it, anecdotally and, and with what I'm hearing from, from our customers, no, it, it can be a evolutionary step. We can fold these things into our operational um, practices. We can start with maybe a new branch, or we can start with just tasks or those, those, those painful things that we're doing. We can start automating those away and do things in increments and in steps um, so that when we're ready, when we've done enough of this, we're either currently doing using something like DNA Center and fully embracing the intent-based networking um, paradigm, or we've gotten to a point where within our operational rigor, within our process, we are automating everything and we are able to drive those new user experiences because we've gotten things so tight and we've, we've made things so much more streamlined within, uh, within our daily routines. So it doesn't have to be overnight. You'll find that you'll just keep getting better. You'll keep learning new things as you iterate through these processes and, and, and embrace some of these technologies. Right, right. And, and you touched on something that I really love. Um, the future, it's, as we approach that, it's evolutionary. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not revolutionary. Um, and speaking of that, uh, Cisco recently announced um, the release of an all-new training and certification yeah, we program. Did. Um, so explain to us some of the biggest changes <laughs> of that program. Everything, <laughs> as Gary Oldman once said in, in a movie. Everyone. Um, so we changed everything, uh, but, but we, we did it very purposely, and we did it with uh, a lot of research and talking to internal stakeholders, experts uh, in the networking space, experts in the software space. We also went externally to um, uh, people hiring managers, people who are hiring network engineers, hiring um, the, the software developers. We talked to our uh, CCIE advisory board, external um, people who are leading teams of network engineers who work with, uh, who, who have come up across uh, many of these transformations. And we said, what is it that we need to do with our certifications to achieve the principles around agility, uh, around value, and that we really, that our certified people demonstrate leadership? Uh, goes back to that technologist, that, that, that virtual CIO, CTO thing I mentioned. So the first thing we did was we took, uh, we looked at our uh, Cisco Certified Network Associates, CCNA, and we have so many of the CCNAs, and what we've done is we've gotten rid of all the different uh, flavors of CCNA and created one. It's not a unified CCNA. I mean, we didn't take all of those, those different things and cram them into one test. What we did is we, we did that got that, that perspective. What do we need from an associate level engineer? Um, what is it that, that hiring managers want? What is it that team leaders want of that individual? And we created a CCNA that's more broad, um, but it, it focuses on different aspects of the network, aspects that, that you are going to see as a, a, a junior level engineer. Um, mm -hmm. That is the core of the routing and the switching, also wireless, 
don't typically see a network these days without it. Security, you definitely uh, don't see a network without security. And we folded in these principles around automation and programmability. So even at the associate level, people are getting familiar with those concepts. And what this enables the associate level engineer to do is kind of enter an organization, hit the ground and pivot to where they need to be, where their team leader needs them to be. Um, and as they develop the experience, um, they can decide where they want to focus. What is their next step as they grow their career and as they continue along their career path? Um, not just, <clears throat> we didn't just stop at the, at the associate, at the professional and the expert level. We, again, wanted to espouse that agility so that, that our certified individuals uh, find value in the program, value to their org, and also demonstrate that leadership. So what we did is we created uh, CCMP and CCIE with um, uh, five tracks. We have enterprise, service provider, data center, um, security, and collaboration. Inside each of one of those tracks, we have a technology core. One exam will be this technology core that covers key tenets, principles, and skills that those professional and expert level engineers need to have within that technology track. And then at the NP level, we have concentration exams. So you will take another concentration exam within that same track that gives you the, the depth that you want in a specific area. And this is based on where your career, uh, where you want your career to go or what you're currently doing in your job. Uh, and finally, with the uh, IE, uh, we wanted to focus more on that holistic life cycle. We expect, or, or employers are now expecting those IEs to have that a little bit of that low-level design. Um, they have, of course, the ability to operate and optimize, troubleshoot the network. Um, and then they also have the ability to, um, through optimization with automation, programmability, be able to, to add on some of those transformative capabilities. So what you'll see in the, uh, the CCIE lab practicals is uh, there will be a, a focus on that automation across uh, all the tracks. And while I said there were five, and there are in the, in the network engineer realm five, the, another big thing we did is DevNet. DevNet. We added a, uh, a whole DevNet realm to our certification portfolio. That means DevNet also has a Cisco certified DevNet associate there is a Cisco certified DevNet professional with a number of DevNet specific concentrations around things like DevOps, IoT, and WebEx. And coming soon, we will also have a DevNet professional, Cisco certified DevNet professional exam. We've also created, um, in each one of the five network engineering tracks, we've created a automation and programmability concentration that spans between the network engineer realm and that DevNet software developer realm. So it can allow the engineer, the network engineer, to, as they're developing their network engineer skills, also start to become that, that hybrid engineer, bring in uh, via the training, via the certification and, and the experience they gain, bring in those software skills uh, as well. And the last thing we did is learning is so critical um, for all of us. Um, I, I love to learn. I love to play with new things and gather new experiences. Um, Cisco, we believe in everyone should be learning every day. Uh, so in order to uh, facilitate that for recertification purposes, we've opened up our continuing education program to all levels. Previously, it was just CCIE. Now you'll be able to use continuing education from course training courses you take, Cisco Live that you attend, uh, exam items that you write, you'll be able to earn CE credit at the NA level and at the NP level. Those, uh, those DevNet exams, uh, those DevNet training that you'll take, they'll also apply uh, for continuing edu uh, education credit for the uh, network engineer. So again, we, we, we added a, we, we expanded our commitment to learning uh, as well as part of this portfolio relaunch. Right, so not too many changes. No, just again, <laughs> everything. <laughs> So how can, how can the new certifications pave a new path for network professionals and um, software developers? So the, the certifications, uh, the training, they, they, they set the groundwork. They, they give you things to study. They give you things to, to look at and, and hopefully to take, internalize, and start to explore how I can actually use this. So what am I going to do next? I took this training or I got this certification. 
What do I want to do next with these skills? How can I bring that into my organization and make a positive impact? So we want the um, we want these certifications to set that groundwork or set the stage for that engineer to uh, grow within their career or to find the the, the career they want. Uh, in terms of getting started, um, it it gives people uh, from a software. Uh, perspective, it gives people a way of transitioning from that network engineer, as I mentioned with those, those five automation and programmability concentrations, into the, um, into the DevNet realm. They can start to say, yeah, I really like the software uh, world. I like uh, integrating uh, software components into the network, and they cross over and they start to explore how they can become more or do more with something like DevOps. Or how can they embrace IoT from a, uh, from a developer standpoint? And this allows people to carve out their own career journey or own career path um, as they see fit, based on on what motivates them, what they uh, what they truly find exciting. Right, right. So, so if I'm if I'm a network engineer right mm -hmm. now, how, sure. what's what's a way for me to start developing my software skills? So we've got a lot of training that is either. Uh, coming out or is already out. So the training for these new um, certifications is starting to roll out, has started to roll out I mean, August now, uh, in June. Um, so June, July, up until uh, our go-live date, which is February 24th of next year of 2020. So look for that training. Uh, DevNet at developer.cisco.com already has many learning labs, especially for those, uh, like you said, you're a network engineer wanting to develop <laughs> software. Um, you can go check out the DevNet learning labs, uh, the sandbox environments that they have. You can look at uh, tools like Viral, the virtual internet routing labs, as a way of testing out these capabilities, testing out these functions in a safe uh, environment, in, in, at your own pace. I myself, I, I like to learn hands-on. I like learning by example, and then going back and seeing how, how I can apply that. And things like the DevNet Learning Labs and, and Viral give me an opportunity to play with these things without needing to purchase a lot of new hardware or without having to test in production. Um, so I, I definitely um, would say look at that. And then when the certifications roll out as the network engineer, look at those automation and programmability specialist uh, exams. They will count towards continuing education or count towards recertification. Uh, so go and, and, and pursue them, study for them, and find out how you then want to, to take your software journey from there. Sure, sure. So, so overall, what advice, what advice do you have for aspiring network engineers that are they're just starting their careers, just starting out? Don't fear the software. Um, I, I present, or I, I lecture from time to time at uh, NC State University, or in North Carolina. Um, and I tell the students there, you guys, you're so lucky. They are getting an opportunity, and, and I hear this about students across universities across the world, getting an opportunity to look at the core tenets or principles of around networking, the routing and the switching. They're learn they're, I never got to play with that uh, at, in college. Um, and they're getting a chance to do that, plus they're getting exposure to not just the automation and the programmability, but they're looking at things like data science. They're looking at things like machine learning, artificial intelligence. They're, they're getting a chance within an academic world to play with this. So a lot of these early in career uh, individuals come out and Software is the last thing they fear, uh, but it, it gives them a perspective that's very interesting. And I would just say, in general, um, for anyone getting started in the IT and the networking space, software is becoming more of the norm. That, that ability to automate, that ability to do things at scale is becoming more of the norm. So, so embrace that. Uh, look at what we're doing from a, uh, a, like a CCNA perspective, because we're trying to set a, a, um, a foundation that we can evolve to meet the skills that, we, um, that, that we're going to see from the industry, that we're hearing from our customers, from our partners, and we're trying to uh, evolve our program continually to keep up with that. But it's always going to be about what works for you as an individual, you as an individual, me as an individual. Uh, so finding out what 
I, you want to do next, and always be experimenting, always be trying to figure out how this is going to work. I, like I said, I love the hands-on personally. I, I think it really helps one to crystallize some of these concepts when they see them work. Um, it gives them that, that sense of accomplishment, and it, it may inspire them to think about what's next or what, how this will then work within uh, their organization from more of a production standpoint. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so now, what, what value do you feel certifications bring to IT professionals today? This is uh, an interesting question. Um, certainly, the certification asserts at, at a certain level that you have some expertise at the level that the certification dictates. It's more maybe a scientific term. I go, I take the certification, I studied for these, uh, for this, I studied this material. This is uh, what I, really what I know, at the certification level. What we're seeing, though, from various job sites. Uh, posting sites is that certifications do open doors. They, they allow you to take that next step in, in pursuing a career, um, and they allow you to move uh, more quickly through career development. So certification provides that, that kind of a gating criteria, but it's, it's a start. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be the destination of, of this path. It should be a start that now enables you to start building the experience. Because experience is really key. It's, it's how to then do I apply what I've learned through the training, through the certification, that's going to show that I bring value or I bring leadership. It's that experience that, that, that helps drive that person to do more and, and to, to be more successful. And ideally, if we're doing, if we're doing our job from a certification standpoint, we want, and this is part of what our, our portfolio um, launch in, in February is going to be, uh, if we're doing it right, we're meeting, we're evolving our certification portfolio to meet the needs of the industry. And that's what we want to do. We want to keep up that agility to continually refresh uh, as needed, to add more of those concentrations, to give um, people th those opportunities to assert those skills and to give them those self-checks that they have the skill, now they can start building uh, or continue to build that experience in those areas. Okay, great. Um, well, we're actually going to stop here and we're going to open up our forum for the uh, community watching online and take some of your questions. Um, all right, let's let's get started. Okay. Please. Okay. Um, <laughs> possibly go wrong. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Okay, let's see. Um, Joe, I was a senior network engineer with 15 years of experience and I moved from my track as a project manager since the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. If I need to get back into network track, the networking track, where should I start at? Huh, interesting question. So you were a network, senior network engineer for many years, um, went into project, uh, project management. It really depends on how much you think you, you have retained from the networking uh, level uh, or networking uh, senior network engineer job and, and where you, um, where you want to go. What do you want to do next uh, in that networking area? I would say if you were, um, and it also depends on where in networking you were, were you more in the data center side, service provider side, um, maybe enterprise networking side. Um, I probably don't need to uh, revisit the CCNA. Uh, sounds like you probably have retained uh, quite a bit of, of those skills. Um, you're probably looking at some of the uh, technology core exams, the, not just the exams, but the material uh, there, because, again, if we're doing it right, uh, we should have, have geared those uh, exams uh, to the skills needed in those various tracks. Um, and and start to look at that train. <clears throat> excuse me. Look at that training material as it becomes available. Um, take those training uh, offerings or, or or do the research around those topics because that is uh, where those various uh, areas of networking where we see uh, the current core skill set there, and then figure out what you want to do specifically on your career um, path and embrace some of the. Uh, skills or some of the technology spelled out in the concentrations um, as a way of, of kind of getting a, a, a barometer of where the networking world is and then again seeing what you want to do um, specifically to yourself to, to get into that, uh, re-get into that. Yeah, that was a great question. Um, I, I love this one. 
Okay, if I were interested in getting into Cisco's DevNet journey and learn Python, should I skip the Python training and just learn the foundation within the DevNet pathway? Hmm. Okay, my opinion. <laughs> um, so I started out in biochemistry and molecular genetics. I know you didn't ask that question, but here, here's the answer. Um, I, my grades plummeted and I, because I was always in the computer lab. I got into computer science, uh, taught myself Perl, uh, really liked Perl, uh, then taught myself a few other languages, and then I was told Python. You need Python. Huh. I don't know it. Um, I, I could go and I could take some of the, like the Python for network engineer, but I, I myself really wanted to understand like Python programming. How, how am I, how could I best use this? What are some of the, the cool aspects of the language? Why would I use that over Perl, as an example? Um, so I went and, um, and, and first started uh, with the Coursera course, actually. Uh, didn't really teach me a lot of Python for networking, but taught me a lot of the object-oriented aspects of Python, a lot of the kind of the, what they call Pythonic things about the language. So I started that way and then got into looking at um, more of, of what you would call the DevNet side of things, more of how do I apply Python within the networking space, looking at things like uh, on-box Python programming on our NXOS and iOS XE devices, looking at how I can uh, write Python applications that interface with our uh, REST APIs and, and, and various products that we have. Like, for example, uh, the bot work I mentioned for Cisco Live, I did that uh, in Python interfacing with Web, WebEx Teams. So for me, it was more, I wanted to know the language and, and get really familiar with it. If you're just looking maybe to, to uh, script some of those, those networking tasks or interface with some of those APIs, uh, jumping in, in the, uh, directly in the DevNet uh, learning labs might be, or, or the Python programming for network engineer might be a good approach. But I, I, I like understanding a little bit of the core of the language because it can, it can help make not necessarily me a great application developer, but it can help me be a better automator or write better, uh, more uh, reusable or more readable code. Right, and and you might and you might have answered this next question a little bit, but I'm going to ask it anyway because mm -hmm. um, a lot of people are, start, are writing about Python. Um, they want to know how to get started. How is it applied to networking, and the best resources for getting started, specifically to Python? Okay, uh, so I mentioned there's a, a, a course that uh, Learning at Cisco offers called Python for uh, Python Programming for Network Engineers. I believe that's PRNE. And as I mentioned, the DevNet uh, Learning Labs uh, developer.cisco.com has quite a bit on directly applying Python uh, towards uh, networking or Cisco networking use cases. Uh, in terms of, of, like I mentioned, just in general, there are a lot of uh, online courses about general Python programming. Uh, but what we have at DevNet, what we're uh, offering in um, uh, for w within the courses that, that we have at Learning at Cisco can certainly help you jumpstart into the networking side of applying Python towards those networking use cases. Um, okay. Uh, in the recertification policy, this person writes, I see continuing education credits. What are they and why are they useful? Okay. Where, where, I'm sorry, where are they useful? Where are they useful? Yes. Yes. So <laughs> continuing education credits are used for recertification. So I will use myself as an example. I have a CCIE route switch. On February 24th of next year, it will be migrated to this new CCIE uh, enterprise um, in network infrastructure. In order for me to recertify my CCIE today, <laughs> and in fact I have to recertify by December 5th, I can either take, today, I can take the ACCIE written exam, and that will recertify me for, for two years, so then I would have to recertify again December 5th of 2021, or I can recertify using continuing education. So continuing education, I can go and take a, a instructor-led course or an online um, course from our, our digital learning catalog. In fact, that's what I'm, I'm doing. I'm taking some data center uh, courses right now. And as I complete those courses, as I work through and complete the challenge quizzes and, and the labs, uh, once I complete the course, I will earn a certain number of credits. And the credits depend on the duration of the course and depend on the technical complexity of the course. Uh, for today, for the CCIE, I have to get 100 of these credits. When I get 100, I can go to the 
uh, CE portal. I can apply them. There's an administrative fee today, and I will recertify my CCIE again for two years. After February 24th, or on February 24th and beyond, uh, it's not just for the CCIE. CE credits or the CE program will be open to NA and NP, and credit values change. CCIE now becomes 120 credits. There will be no more administrative fee. Um, and so when I earn those credits, I will recertify my, my case, my CCIE, and that will be good for three years from the moment I complete my last um, CE credit activity or my last recertification activity. I now have three I'll have three active years of CCIE. Same thing, uh, CCMP will be three years, CCNA will be three years. So long answer to the, the, credit, the, the CE credits question, but CE credits I earn towards recertifying um, and after or on February 24th, recertifying any of these uh, network engineering exams. Great. Okay, um, here's another one. Even with the old Cisco certifications, many certified people have trouble getting into the IT industry. Do the new certifications validate skills or your knowledge? We are hoping, so the, the exams themselves have traditionally been more about the knowledge, admittedly. So a lot of multiple choice, a lot of, of drag and drop. Um, it, it was because from a uh, very standardized, very rigorous um, testing approach. That's what we, that's, those were the tools that we had. So there was a lot of knowledge there, admittedly. What we're also doing with our um, exam processes now is being able to fold in new technology there to do uh, simulations. So it's not just about uh, doing a knowledge, it's about putting in like virtual instances of our operating systems. So it's really testing skills. Can you really apply what you know to troubleshoot a dynamic situation on a real uh, but virtual uh, instance of our uh, operating system? So what we're trying to do is up-level the exams as well to allow people to demonstrate that not only do they, they know uh, information, not only do they know um, these newer uh, technology aspects, but they've demonstrated the skill as part of that exam. Again, so it can open those doors to start building the experience. So we want to make the exams themselves not only more relevant from the content, but more relevant from how they are being uh, presented to the uh, candidate. Okay, um, I think that really ties into this next one. <clears throat> says, with Cisco's new certification track, will printed training material be useful in the future, or will the best training and skills be learned by hand, by hands-on or lab training? So I believe, <laughs> and I've already said that I'm a big proponent of the hands-on. So I, I, I think that the, the printed material, less so, certainly if it's truly printed, it comes out of date pretty quick. I think it's more about getting your hands dirty. And now that we have a lot of these uh, virtualized environments, these sandbox environments, it becomes easier to do that. Uh, DevNet, for example, has what they call always-on labs, things that you can just connect to at any time without, without booking them, uh, to be able to play with some, specifically on the software side, some of these things. With uh, Viral, you can play with any type of, of networking and some of the um, software uh, technologies as well. So, for example, I... At home, I have an instance of viral. I stand that up and I can apply. Uh, I have some open source network management software. I point to it. Uh, I've used it to test out things like the RESTConf and NetConf interfaces on our devices. So it gives me a, a, an opportunity to um, build some muscle memory, build some actual operational uh, experience with these things. And I, I think that's the best for being able to uh, really understand how these um, skills can be can be applied in, in the real world. Okay. Um, next, what's the difference between the Meraki platform and DevNet Python? Are these the same paths or, or separate initiatives? And where do you start with each? Huh. <laughs> uh, so the Meraki, if, if I understood, so DevNet Python is, well, let's take a, a step back. So Meraki, uh, itself is, is a cloud-managed way of, um, software-as-a-service way of, of provisioning and managing your network. 
So for example, every device that you buy or you get with its Meraki uh, will connect back to the uh, cloud. It'll register, gets its config from there, and uh, allows you with a portal, web-based portal, to manage that, uh, apply additional configuration changes, and build that, that network infrastructure. Uh, they include security, switching, routing, wireless. Um, and uh, I believe some, some video as well in there. The other thing Meraki offers is a quite comprehensive RESTful API on top of their uh, platform. I've personally used it. It's very effective for being able to uh, provision a network, be able to apply configuration changes from more of an automation standpoint. Um, and in order to interface with that, I've used Python. So I build a little Python kind of layer, abstraction layer on top of the Meraki API uh, for being able to um, provision new network um, uh, networks. And um, uh, I did that specifically, uh, not that you asked, but for a friend of mine who was, who was doing quite a bit with Meraki. Um, DevNet, uh, in, in what they're doing, is trying to build a community around uh, developer, uh, developer skills, uh, around developer um, uh, code, uh, with what, uh, everything we're doing uh, within Cisco that, that, that touches software. So what they're trying to do is, is build some of that outreach to, to work with members of the community to make sure that they feel comfortable with those skills, to provide training around those skills, to provide examples, um, code, reusable code, good quality code that can help you apply uh, those, those skills, those, those capabilities in, in your own lives and your own organizations. So they're, I would say, Specifically to the question, Meraki and DevNet, um, the DevNet side covers some aspects of, of Meraki, uh, covers some aspects of how one can use the API, and Meraki exposes those capabilities to give you the, um, uh, to give you the ability to automate a Meraki-based network. Okay, great. Um, for those listening, if you're more, if you're interested in learning more about Python specific content, please visit developer.cisco.com forward slash start now. Um, that's where you'll find a wealth of information about that. Um, our, our next question. Okay. okay. Um, all right. So from JJ, I'm a CCNP routing and switching certified network administrator. Okay. And currently I'm working with Meraki routers and switches. Looking to get a new certification, is DevNet certification a good choice for me? Well, JJ, um, I, we have never met um, virtually. I hope you're doing well. <laughs> um, is DevNet a good certification for you? It, if, if you want to start exploring how you can apply some of the, uh, say, DevNet, uh, sorry, DevOps concepts, or how you could start making use of uh, APIs in a uh, kind of a good fashion, make use of, of testing, uh, software testing elements uh, in your day-to-day -day job? Absolutely. I would say the, the skills around the, uh, the DevNet professional um, in, say, the uh, DevOps area, that's something I've very much considered. I, I think it makes a, a, a great um, certification or a great uh, training uh, resource as you uh, as as anyone wants to grow their career in that area. If that's if that's what you're looking for, if you want to to kind of start getting your feet a little bit wet before become before uh, doing the uh, full DevNet uh, one of the, the the DevNet side certifications, look at the uh, automation uh, and programmability certifications. Uh, you said you're a CCMP RNS, so you'll be a CCMP Enterprise on the migration. Look at the uh, automating and programming uh, Cisco Enterprise networks, uh, the training and certification there, as a way to see how you can fold in some of those uh, software skills from the enterprise standpoint. And then you can see, is this something that really excites me? Is this something I really want to uh, continue to, to, to grow in? And then the DevNet um, professional uh, on the DevOps track will bring in more aspects of that, um, uh, more rigor around the software, around the, the, the development aspects. And it can be a, a way of catalyzing you maybe to write applications, robust applications that sit on top of that Meraki infrastructure that you're managing today. Okay. Um, well, that's all we have time for today. Um, I'd like wow. to thank my guests. We're done already. Uh, done already. <laughs> well, thanks for the questions. Um, thanks for having me. This is great. Thanks so much for being here. Um, 
Thank you. Your time has been very interesting, and thanks for a great discussion. My pleasure. Um, to learn more about how you can take your career to the next level with Cisco, check out the links provided. Um, we have information about our new certification program. Um, it's coming February 2020. The Cisco Learning Network, devnet, developer.cisco.com. Great resources for both of those initiatives. And, of course, continue to view the comments on our Cisco chat hashtag. I wanted to thank you all for watching us, and stay learning. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you.